Kellogg is a major villain in Fallout 4, and as a consequence, to tell his story means that I'm going to be revealing some major Fallout 4 plot spoilers pertaining to the middle of the game. So if you don't want to see spoilers, turn back now. Kellogg is unique among the other villains of the game, as he's one of the only ones who admits that he's a villain. Father thinks that the Institute is the best hope for humanity. Maxon thinks that he's saving the world by hoarding technology and keeping it out of the hands of those who would use it to repeat the mistakes from mankind's past. Even Pikmin thinks that he's doing the world a favor by only satisfying his serial killer desires by killing raiders. But Kellogg admits that he's a monster. Instead of trying to convince you that he's really good, he excuses what he does by pointing at the world around him. The world is a horrible place, which is why he does horrible things. Kellogg's story is told to us in snippets throughout the game. I want to tell his story chronologically, and so today we will start in his childhood. The earliest moment we find Kellogg is when he's a ten-year-old boy or so, lying on his bed reading comic books next to his mother. And that makes it official, folks. The final vote counts. Turn down the goddamn radio! I'm trying to sleep! California Republic. All five states have now signed on, which means that as of this moment, we are all citizens of the new California Republic. I'm sure that's going to take some getting used to for a lot of people. Mm, what a joke. What's it mean, Mom? Nothing, Connie. People like to talk and hope someone else is going to keep them safe. Teacher at school said the NCR would bring back the good old days. Like, before the big war. Don't you listen to that twaddle. I'm going to stop sending you if that's what they're teaching you. I'm going out. Where the fuck did you put my boots? Listen to me, Connie. You take this. You're old enough. You're the man of the family now. It's your job to protect us. Your father's useless, but you won't turn out like him. You're a good boy. And all that on the radio. All useless talk. The only thing that will protect you in this world is that gun in your hands. You need to learn to use it if you're going to survive. I... I will, Mom. I promise. I won't let you down. You have always been my good boy. Conrad Kellogg was born in the year 2179, on the western coast of the United States. We heard from that radio broadcast that he spent his childhood during the formative years of the NCR, when the NCR became a prominent political presence on the west coast. His mother is not fond of politics, she says it's all useless, and teaches him from a very young age when she gives him his first pistol, that the only thing that will take care of him is himself. A strong lesson on self-reliance which is admirable, but it's a slippery slope from self-reliance to isolation. Dad was either drunk or not around. I guess he must have run with one of the raider gangs, but I never really knew what he did. Don't know why Mom was with him. Maybe at some point in his life he wasn't a complete asshole. He came from a troubled home. His dad was a former raider and a drunk. I was such a dummy back then. What did I know about how the world worked? I think now she wanted me to kill him. I should have. Instead, I ended up running away. I told myself I wanted to find somewhere out from under the thumb of the NCR and all their rules. But really, I was running from the guilt of not protecting her from Dad. Yeah, it doesn't matter now, though. Kellogg is a practical man, and he has little patience for people whom he thinks are fools. People who don't know how the world works. He learns how the world works, but as we will soon see, the lessons are hard. Mom knew how it was. She wasn't soft, but uh, she loved me in, in her way. And she protected me from Dad. <laughs> that cost her more than a few beatings. I never knew what happened to her after I left. I didn't want to know. Not then. People always hoping for something better. 
I usually end up with something worse. Like his mother taught him, he's skeptical of change. Political change scared him as a child. He didn't like following rules. He wanted to be his own master. And for those reasons, he abandoned his mother, one of the only people who ever even vaguely cared for him. After he left home, he spent many years wandering California working as a mercenary. He ran with raider gangs. He found a woman at the hub named Sarah, and the two of them fell in love. Together they moved to San Francisco where they had their child, Mary. It's gonna be fine. You'll see. But we don't know anybody here. And now, with the baby? Come on, Sarah. You've gotta give it a chance. I finally got steady work with a good outfit. Nothing like that in the NCR these days. No, I, I'm not saying this was a mistake. I, I'm just... Are you sure these guys know what they're doing? They seem kind of green. I know. But that's where I come in. Just wait. In a few years, I'll be running my own crew. As soon as I make the connections I need. Then I can give you anything you want. And little Mary, too. I never worried about you before. Must be my mama instincts kicking in. <laughs> Who knew I had those, huh? Come on, you're great with her. And you don't need to worry about me. Most of it's just running security for the she. A lot of standing around looking tough. Well, they sure picked the right person for that job. Listen, it's gonna be great here. See this? This is what's going to keep you and Mary safe. I promise. I know, Connie. I'm sure we're going to be really happy here. We are. You'll see. That's okay. I got it. We learn from this exchange that he worked for the She. We meet the Shi in Fallout 2. The Shi descended from the crewmen of a Chinese submarine that beached in San Francisco. The crew members relocated to Chinatown of San Francisco and stripped the submarine of all of its computers. The computer eventually evolved to become a very powerful artificial intelligence and began to call itself the Emperor. The Shi was gifted in science. They did a lot of research, they developed technology, but they were isolationists. They wanted to keep to themselves. Sound familiar? Kellogg was drawn to the Shi and got work from them apparently as a guard. They didn't have a large military presence and instead relied on a small high-tech fighting force that guarded the Steel Palace, which was their headquarters in Chinatown. At the time, they were one of the most advanced technological factions in California with the ability to refit T-51 power armor. After running with raiders in his youth, it looks like Kellogg decided to work with the Shi because it seemed like more stable work as he says, standing around as a guard and looking tough. The thing about happiness is, is you only know you had it when it's gone. I mean, you, you may think to yourself that you're happy, but uh, you don't really believe it. You focus on the petty bullshit or next job or whatever. It's only looking back by comparison with what comes after, that you really understand that's what happiness felt like. This is an amazingly perceptive observation on Kellogg's part. He's so right. But what do we learn about Kellogg from this admission? We learn that he was never happier than when he was struggling in a new town, trying to make a name for himself. Not sure what was ahead of him, but with a woman who loved him and a child to care for. I was the worst thing that ever happened to her. If she'd never met me, she'd have stayed in the hub, maybe hooked up with someone who didn't kill people for a living. Probably been happier than she was with me. Almost certainly lived longer. Whatever made me think that a guy like me should have a daughter? No, I, I never deserved her. Not for one second. He says he never deserved to have a daughter, and he speaks as if what he is is somehow inevitable. 
What made me think a guy like me should have a daughter? But if he truly is a master of his own destiny, a man who follows no rules, which is why he left the NCR to begin with, then he can be any kind of man he wants. He can be a man who does deserve a daughter, who can do something else than kill people for a living, as many others do. Many farmers, many settlers, live their lives without killing people for a living. But Conrad Kellogg chose this lifestyle for himself, maybe because he thought that's just who he was. He couldn't be anything else. I thought San Francisco was my chance to start fresh. I was the hot shit, the gunslinger from the hub, rolling into town with the world at my feet. Everybody knew I was the one who'd shot Valdez. I could write my own ticket to any outfit in town. It all worked out pretty damn well. For a while. I don't know who Valdez is that Kellogg refers to here. There are two Valdezes I was able to find. One was a man named Nicholas Valdez, who lived in Vault 22. We read about him when exploring that vault in Fallout New Vegas. But he was exposed to the spores in that vault and presumably died or was turned into one of those spore people. So there's no way Kellogg could have shot him. The other Valdez is not Valdez, it's Valdez. And it's a ship. In Fallout 2, there's an old diesel tanker that can be used to travel from the mainland to the Enclave oil rig. Again, it doesn't make sense in this context for Kellogg to say that he shot Valdez if he's talking about Valdez, the ship. But it's clear that after he left home, he worked as a mercenary or a raider under the thumb of the NCR and made a name for himself before moving to San Francisco to work for the She to marry Sarah, to have Mary, and to try to settle down. How did you think this was going to end, Kellogg? <laughs> you thought you could just fuck with us, and we wouldn't fuck with you? Just so you know, they died like dogs. And you weren't there to help them. The voice is right. How did Kellogg think this was going to end? Kellogg has an almost fatalistic view of the world. He sometimes speaks as a victim, as if the world has somehow victimized him. Or he can't help who he is, he can't help what he does. But if he chooses to make a living, taking contracts to kill people, making enemies, then of course he puts his loved ones in danger. His wife Sarah and his child Mary were murdered. We don't know who killed them. We can presume from this memory that Kellogg enacted revenge, but that revenge didn't bring his wife and daughter back. His wife, his daughter, they were victims. And Kellogg was a victim too, but he victimized himself. Mind if we sit down? Suit yourself. So, um, I hear you'll take care of people's problems. Is that right? If you pay me. Oh, we'll pay you. And, uh, you'll do this all by yourself? That's right. We pay you when the job is done. Is that okay? That's the way you want to do it? So who do you want dead? Well, it's like this. There's his family. Lives down the creek a ways. I didn't care where I was going. Ended up mostly wandering east. Getting as far away from San Francisco as I could, maybe. There was always a job for someone like me. Didn't matter what it was. Didn't matter who I was supposed to kill. I got pretty good at it. There was always someone who wanted someone else dead. Sometimes just roughed up, but uh, dead was usually what they wanted. Sometimes they thought they could cheat me. That was usually only when I first arrived somewhere. Didn't matter to me. They just took it as part of the job. A little extra thrown in for free. I always got paid in the end. One way or another. I don't remember much from that time. It all kind of blends together. It was almost always a bar, though. That's universal. Sometimes victims recover from being victimized to lead normal and healthy lives. And sometimes people use their victimhood as an excuse to victimize others. Here, Kellogg is hired to kill a family. 
He doesn't care about them. He doesn't care about the lives he's ruining. After all, this is a horrible world. He's excused for being horrible because he has to live in a horrible world. If his family was taken from him, then no one can blame him for taking away someone else's family. Since he was a victim, it's just part of life that he makes sure other people become victims too. This is a form of cowardice. I'm not saying Kellogg is always a coward. He has to be either brave or reckless to do the kind of work that he does. But it takes a strong person to defy the world around him. The world around Kellogg is horrible, so Kellogg becomes horrible. If Kellogg were a stronger man, he would defy the horrible world and still try to do good. But that's the problem with men who live by strength alone. Men who use force, intimidation, and violence to make a name for themselves. Eventually, they run out of strength. As they age, they lose the ability to back up their threats. Mr. Kellogg, I'm glad you decided to meet with me. So, you're with the Institute. I wanted to see for myself if you really existed. We do, as you can see. What do you want? It's come to my attention that you've been rather disruptive of our operations lately. This must stop. I do what people pay me to do. If that's a problem for you, I can see only one way out. And what's that, Mr. Kellogg? If I'm working for you, there's no more problem. From what I hear, you can afford me. I don't think you fully understand the situation you're in. I think I do. Very well. B-748, initiate. Hmm. Impressive. We may have something to talk about after all. Conrad Kellogg felt old age creeping upon him, and so he sought out something safer, something he was familiar with. He worked for the Xi, an organization that developed technology, where he could be a simple guard, where he had job security, where he had a stable income. He traveled the entire continental United States, presumably on foot, over the span of decades working as a mercenary, until he arrived at the East Coast. In Boston, he heard rumor of the Institute which reminded him of the Xi, an isolationist group of people who kept to themselves and used technology to their advantage. I finally ended up in the Commonwealth. I kind of ran out of road. Plus, I'd come to terms with life. I wasn't going to be stupid enough to get mixed up with caring about other people again. It was just me against the world. And the world had it coming. He sees caring about people as a weakness, and the most foolish thing he could possibly be in this horrible world is weak. So as a matter of logical consequence, he can't care about people. But what he doesn't realize is that when he cares about people, people care about him back. When it's just you against the world, you're not strong, you're weak. The great foolishness is to think you can stand against the world. No one can. The wiser man makes friends, makes family makes allies, because in times of trouble, true friends, true family will stand with him when he needs them. He says he came to terms with life, but he had to come to terms with this life he made for himself by going through a lot of pain and a lot of anguish, by becoming a victim and by victimizing others, and that's not something smart people do. Smart people don't have to learn the hard lessons in life the hard way. Smart people listen to the wisdom of their elders, to the wisdom of people who have already learned those hard lessons. The fool learns every lesson in life the hard way, through experience. The wise man learns life's hard lessons from people who already experience them, so that he doesn't have to experience them himself. Now, part of this is not his fault. He didn't have a good childhood. He didn't have a good father who could teach him these life lessons. He didn't have a good father who could tell him that, you know what, if you kill a lot of people, a lot of people are gonna want your blood and are gonna seek revenge. He didn't have a father who taught him that. He doesn't know about the strength of families and friendships and alliances because to him, relationships have always ended poorly. They've always made him weaker. That's the experience he's had. He's never experienced anything better. And so in his mind, family, relationships, love makes you weak. Checking through the logs. Hopefully it's all... Just find it. Pod C6, down the hall near the end. 
This is the one. Here. Open it. <laughs> is it open? Almost. Everything's going to be fine. Okay? Come here. No. Come here, baby. Wait. No. I've got him! Let the boy go. I'm only going to tell you once. I'm not giving you Sean! God damn it. Get the kid out of here and let's go. At least we still have the backup. Cryogenic sequence reinitialized. What's the holdup? I'm almost finished, Kellogg. I just need to confirm. Come on, come on, come on. All right, we're good. We've seen how Kellogg the Man was formed, and it culminates in the greatest crime he does to the sole survivor when he kills your spouse and takes your child. He does so without blinking because, again, this is life. He doesn't care that he's doing to the sole survivor what happened to him. In his mind, it's the sole survivor's fault for being weak and foolish. If you have a family to begin with, you're just asking to be victimized. He excuses it, explains it all away, diverts taking personal responsibility for the world that he's living in by saying that it's a world created by someone else. He is not responsible for his actions, someone else's, the people who victimized him and the governments that dropped the bombs. It's a convenient bit of self-delusion that's not rare, not even in real life. Big heads never like taking orders from a dirty, contaminated degenerate like me. But they needed me, and I made sure they knew it. I was now the Institute's main operator in the Commonwealth. If they needed something done, they came to me. It wasn't usual for anybody from the Institute to come along on a mission, so this one stood out. I didn't know then who it was we were grabbing from the vault. Of course, neither did they. Not really. We find evidence of other missions that the Institute sent Kellogg on. Most notably, at University Point, he went there on behalf of the Institute and wiped out every man, woman, and child who lived there just with the hope of getting his hands on some reactor technology that ended up not even being there. I did an entire video on the University Point, which covers this tragedy in great detail, which you can watch here. I'm glad I didn't have to kill the kid. I'm not saying I haven't done it, but uh, I never like to. But it was better this way. Better than taking his kid and leaving him alive. So it was mercy? Mercy to kill the spouse? so that the spouse doesn't have to suffer through a missing child? Well, for all his mercy, he wasn't merciful with the sole survivor. If he truly saw it as mercy to kill the spouse, he would have killed the sole survivor. Kellogg is not a merciful man. He is not a man who thinks for himself. He's a coward who does what other people tell him to do. Because that's just the way the world works. That's just the way smart people survive. I never knew why we didn't just refreeze the rest of them. But we had our orders. <laughs> I guess the old man didn't want so many loose ends. Too bad he left alive the one person he shouldn't have. Now we all know where father the old man comes from, which makes it interesting that here he refers to the person who gave him his orders as the old man. He wasn't sure why the old man didn't just refreeze the rest of them. The old man only chose to refreeze the sole survivor because he needed a backup. So who was the old man? Well, it's possible that Kellogg was referring to the then director, or at least a previous director, who might have been an old man at that time. Even then, I knew it was a mistake leaving her alive. I understood that kind of revenge. No one better. But I was cocky enough to assume I could handle some soft, pre-war vault dweller. Even if she somehow got thawed out. At least I know those Institute bastards will soon get what's coming to them, too. If she could take me out, 
They won't be able to hide from her for long. It's interesting how he describes the Institute here. After all, he sought them out to work for them, and yet for some reason he still resents working for them. Could it be that somewhere in him he realized that what the Institute does is really messed up, and he dislikes being a part of that? He still does it, of course, because that's just how the world works, but maybe he resents the fact that that's how the world works. And so he takes a little bit of glee thinking that the Soul Survivor might do to the Institute what the Soul Survivor did to him. Now, being born in 2179 makes him over 108 years old by the time we meet him in 2287. We see his age in his eyes when we meet him. He may have brown hair. He may have the body of, what, a 40-year-old? But look at his eyes. Those are not young eyes. Those are the eyes of a man who has seen decade after decade. Compare him to when he was young, to the man we saw in his memories. The scars are not there. The age in his face is not there. Something was done to Kellogg to give him a body that was still functional at such an advanced age, but this world has still weighed on him, and we see it in his eyes. This is explained in a holotape that we find in a wing of the Institute that's currently under construction. Construction. The Institute is expanding. They do so periodically over the years to make more room. And here we find a holotape that's a recording of Institute scientists augmenting Kellogg's body with cybernetics. Just keep talking if you can. I'm afraid this may be rather painful. Don't worry about it, Doc. Anesthetic would lower your blood pressure too much, and I need you to remain conscious. You already explained all that. It's gonna be worth it, right? Oh, most definitely. These implants are much more advanced than anything you've had before. Dr. Walter is very pleased with you. The Gen 3 synth program is finally making progress. Thanks to the genetic material you recovered. You talking about that kid we got from the vault? Yes, a perfectly unspoiled DNA sample. Now this next part is especially delicate, so if you could please look straight into the light. Should everything be purple? Hmm? Oh, that's just a calibration error. How about now? Better. I'm just glad to have a chance to test these on a... cooperative human subject. Normally, the directors are very touchy about allowing this kind of technology outside the Institute. They must find you extremely trustworthy. You see, these are gonna work, right, Doc? Oh, yes. When I say test, I simply mean collecting data over time, which will be very valuable to making further improvements. This next part may be exceptionally painful. Try your best to remain conscious. As is habit, the Institute was experimenting even on Kellogg, one of their most trusted mercenaries, with cybernetics. We learned from this holotape that they mostly experimented on unwilling participants, which is why the scientists speaking relished the opportunity to work with a subject who was willing. For a long time, the Institute had been trying to make the perfect soldier, which is why they had the FEV lab where Brian Virgil worked. There, they experimented with FEV to try and make the perfect soldier but ultimately failed. However, these failed experiments directly resulted in supermutants in the Commonwealth. This is something I explored in great detail in my video on the FEV lab, which you can watch here. After FEV turned into a dead end, they worked on human cyborgs, while at the same time they worked on the Android program. After they got Sean's DNA in Vault 111, the Android program transformed into the Gen 3 synth program. They stopped working on cybernetics and stopped tinkering with Kellogg. But by then, Kellogg had been upgraded a number of times, and we learned from from father's terminal in his room, then many of the other scientists within the Institute not only saw Kellogg and were afraid of him, but as father says, 
They saw Kellogg and were envious of him. They saw him as a man untouched by time, as an immortal man. And more than fear, more than disgust, they were envious of him. Like Kellogg before him, Father is a practical man. He uses Kellogg because he knows that Kellogg delivers results. But he also knows what Kellogg has done. Which is why in this terminal entry he says that he knows Kellogg despises the Institute. And the fact that he's even still alive today proves how successful the Institute is. The Institute can claim Kellogg himself as one of their achievements. Father relishes the idea that this may make Kellogg furious. After the sole survivor leaves Vault 111, he or she works with Nick Valentine to track down Sean. Nick asks the sole survivor for a description of the spouse's murderer, which ultimately leads him to identifying Kellogg. One of them came right up to me. Bald head, Scar across his left eye. Wait. It couldn't be. You didn't hear the name Kellogg at all, did you? It's way too big of a coincidence. Ellie, what notes do we have about the Kellogg case? The description matches. Bald head, Scar, reputation for dangerous mercenary work, but no one knows who his employer is. And he bought a house here in town, right? And he had a kid with him, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. The house in the abandoned West Stands. The boy with him was around ten years old. Kellogg did indeed spend some time in Diamond City with what looked like a ten-year-old boy. Kellogg. It's okay. One of these days you're gonna get your head blown off just barging in here like that. Minimizing my exposure to civilians is a priority. Forget I said anything. So what's the big crisis this time? New orders for you. One of our scientists has left the Institute. Left? As in... He's gone rogue. Name's Dr. Brian Virgil. We know he's hiding somewhere in the glowing sea. Here's his file. Wow. Some heads are gonna roll for this. Capture and return, or just elimination? Elimination. He was working on a highly classified program. No kidding. One of the top bioscience boys? Damn. So, I guess you're taking the kid back with you. Affirmative. Your only mission is to locate and eliminate Virgil. You're taking me home to my father? Yes. Stand next to me and hold still. Okay. X688. Ready to relay with Sean. Bye, Mr. Kellogg. I hope I see you again soon. Bye. This whole setup in Diamond City was part of some elaborate plan of the old man's. Seems obvious now that we were bait for our friend from the vault. Timing couldn't have been an accident. It's not how the old man works. I wonder if he outsmarted me in the end. Another loose end tied up. This time he is clearly talking about father when he uses the phrase old man. And he is right. We learn that father chose to allow Kellogg to cross paths with the soul survivor so that he and the soul survivor could get revenge upon Kellogg. Kellogg? He worked for you? Kellogg. He was an institute asset long before I arrived here. It wasn't until I became director that I learned of all the things he'd done. What kind of man he was. You knew the man was a psychopath, but you used him anyway? The Institute took advantage of Kellogg's vicious nature. I will freely admit that. Institute technology prolonged his life and his usefulness far beyond any normal human lifespan. He never failed the Institute. But his cruelty became more apparent with every completed objective. I won't lie. It's no coincidence your path crossed his. It seemed a fitting way to allow you... us... to have some amount of revenge. They stole you. Kidnapped you. Wasn't right. Right, wrong... irrelevant. It was necessary. Your mother. She never got to see you grow up? Yes. What happened to her was... I've gone over the records of the incident, of course. 
It seems her death was an unfortunate bit of collateral damage. <sighs> you don't remember. You didn't see it the way I did. It was brutal. Yes, I'm sure it was. Sadly, the world has become a brutal, unforgiving place. Father, like Kellogg before him, dismisses the brutality of Kellogg's actions by just saying, of course what Kellogg did was brutal, but it's all right, it's, it's a brutal world. He couldn't help it. It's natural for brutal people to do brutal things in a brutal world. It's that kind of thinking that keeps the world brutal, that allows for people to commit atrocities for, for years, and in Kellogg's case, multiple decades. It's good to admit the realities we see before us. Yes, it is a brutal world. Yes, life chews us up and spits us out. We can admit that. We need to be honest about that. We shouldn't try to live in a fantasy, but instead of embracing that brutality, and becoming part of it, strong people, courageous people, reject that brutality. They don't live in a fantasy, they make the fantasy a reality. They prove that they can still achieve greatness without being brutal, that they can still provide for their family and get the things they dreamed for without trampling on others. The idea that the world is this horrible, evil, brutal place and we must do horrible, evil, brutal things to survive it is only true as long as humanity continues to embrace that and pass that on to their children, who then embraces that and then passes it on to their children. Good, better worlds are only made when a generation says, yeah, the world is horrible and brutal and evil and corrupt, but we're going to make different decisions. We may be victims, but we're not going to victimize others. We may have been brutalized, but we will not be brutal. Instead, we will be courageous and tough and still achieve greatness and build civilization. It wasn't my idea to settle down with the kid in the middle of Diamond City. <laughs> I thought it was a terrible idea, actually. But it was one of the old man's pet projects, so here we were. Me and the kid, like a happy little family. I ended up kind of liking it. A reminder of what my life might have been if things had turned out differently. But there's no going back. I knew it was just temporary. It'd be back to normal business before too long. But despite everything we've learned about Kellogg, underneath he's still human and he still craved the family that he lost, the sense of belonging, the ability to provide, the luxury of being loved. He can't help but admit that even though these crazy sentimental sensibilities make people soft, he still likes them. Part of him longs for that time, but he knows he can never go back. For he is no longer in control of his own life, he's given that control to the Institute. After Kellogg left Diamond City, as we heard in that flashback, he went in pursuit of Brian Virgil. But along the way, he got word that the sole survivor was trailing him. And so he diverted to Fort Hagen, where he, surrounded by his synths, set up a temporary post. We find evidence of his journey along the way, in the strewn corpses of raiders and wastelanders, and even an assaultron. Tracking known mercenary. Exercise extreme caution. Alert. Critical signs. Alert. Critical signs. What have we here? Error. System corrupt. I can't feel my legs. What happened here? Error. Operator deceased. Threat level Omega. He killed us. You really got taken apart. Critical systems non-functional. Hostile human. Too powerful. Just tell me where Kellogg went. Tin can. Identity of assailant. Kellogg. This had to be Kellogg. Signature confirmed. Assailant Kellogg. Known associates. Oh, it's just dreadful what Kellogg did to this poor thing. <laughs> After arriving at Fort Hagen and winding our way down into the basement, Kellogg does everything in his power to get the sole survivor to turn back. First, it starts with mockery. He sees everything you're doing. If you think you're sneaking into his home, you're a fool. Maybe he can shame you into leaving. Yeah, if it isn't my old friend, the frozen TV dinner. Last time we met, you were cozying up to the peas and apple cobbler. Then he tries intimidation. 
Sorry, your house has been a wreck for 200 years, but I don't need a roommate. Leave. He commands you to leave. Follow his orders like a good dog, or else suffer the consequences. Then he tries flattery. <laughs> Never expected you to come knocking on my door. Gave you 50-50 odds of making it to Diamond City. After that, figured the Commonwealth would chew you up like jerky. Wow, you're so strong. You actually made it this far. Kellogg is impressed. Maybe the two of you are kindred souls, and you wouldn't want to harm a kindred soul, would you? Go ahead and turn back now. Then he tries understanding. Look, you're pissed off. I get it. I do. But whatever you hope to accomplish in here, it's not going to go your way. He's been where you've been. He's lost family. He's suffered too. But he's older and wiser than you. Maybe you should listen to his advice and turn back now. He knows that you're just gonna die, and he's just looking out for you as a kindred spirit. You got guts and determination. It's admirable. But you are in over your head in ways you can't possibly comprehend. It's not too late. Stop. Turn around and leave. You have that option. Not a lot of people can say that. But what he's really doing is showing his cowardice. He's not telling you to turn back because he really admires you. He's telling you to turn back because he's scared. He never expected the sole survivor to leave Vault 111. The wasteland chewed up his life. The cruelty of life took away his wife and his daughter and turned him into the cold, calculating monster that he is. But you, you suffered too. And instead of rolling over and dying like the pre-war vegetable he thought you were, you emerged and you made friends. Friends that guided the sole survivor right to Kellogg. The fact that the sole survivor has succeeded while not making the same life choices that Kellogg made, well, that confuses him. Life dealt the sole survivor a raw hand. The sole survivor should have made enemies at every turn. The sole survivor should have stood against the world alone. But instead, the sole survivor was diplomatic, worked with Piper, worked with Nick, worked with Dr. Amare, worked with the Brotherhood, worked with the Railroad, worked with the Minutemen, and it only made the sole survivor stronger. This is the first person who he sees as a potential equal, and he has not fought many equals, and that scares him. As his equal approaches, he wants to see if he can talk his way out of this. He knows what's coming. He knows what it's like to seek revenge. After all, he sought revenge upon those who killed his family, and he succeeded. Maybe he can talk the sole survivor down, and maybe not, but at least... He gets to meet his equal face to face. Okay, you made it. I'm just up ahead. My sins are standing down. Let's talk. And there she is. The most resilient woman in the Commonwealth. Enough! Just... Where is my baby? Lady, I'm just a puppet like you. My stage is a little bigger, that's all. End of the line, Kellogg. You die, and I get my son back. You can turn around right now. Go back the way you came. You murdered my husband. Took my baby. You're a dead man. Your husband? That was... a regrettable accident. Still, this world, this life... You've seen it. Pain, suffering. Death is its only escape. You murdering, kidnapping psychopath. Give me my son. Give me Sean, now! Right to it then, huh? Okay. Fine. Your son, Sean. A great kid. A little older than you may have expected. But I'm guessing you figured that out by now. But if you're hoping for a happy reunion, Ain't gonna happen. Your boy's not here. So you see, it is the end of the line. But not the way you imagined. God damn it, you mercenary motherfucker! Where is my son? What's the cliche? So close, but yet so far away? That's Sean. 
But don't worry. You'll die knowing he's safe and happy. A bit older than you expected, but ah well. At least he's in a loving home. Then you're gonna take me to him. Right now. Take you to him. <laughs> like I could, even if I wanted to. Don't you get it? Your son, he's in a place nobody can reach. Fuck you, Kellogg. Let him go. Your time's done. Your son is exactly where he belongs. Tell me where he is, damn it. Fine. I guess you've earned that much. Sean's in a good place. Where he's safe and comfortable and loved. The place he calls home. The Institute. No. That's not true. It can't be. I've come so far. Yes, you have. And believe it or not, I'm actually kind of sorry you wasted your time. In another life, you probably would have been a good mother. But here, in this terrible reality, you just don't get that chance. So where is it, huh? This institute? How do I get there? <laughs> Haven't you been paying attention? You don't find the Institute. The Institute finds you. You open the closet, it's just a closet. You can never find the monster that hides inside. Not until it jumps out at you. Here, the Institute, I'll find my son no matter where he is. <laughs> That's the spirit. You know, you surprise me, I have to admit. I find myself actually kind of liking you, and I admire your dedication, even if it is ultimately useless. Nothing will stop me. God, you're persistent. I give you credit. It's the way a parent should act. The way I'd be acting if I were in your place, I like to think, even if it is useless. But I think we've been talking long enough. We both know how this has to end. So, you ready? In a hundred years, when I finally die, I only hope I go to hell so I can kill you all over again, you piece of shit. On his body, we find the pistol he used to kill our spouse and evidence of the cybernetic experiments that the Institute performed on him. All oh, this tech. You were barely human. But that's not the last word that Kellogg has after everything. After he's lost, after he's been proven the fool, after he's dead and gone, he comes back from the grave, not to be merciful, not to forgive us, not to congratulate us as equals, but just to express his regret, his regret that he wasn't brutal enough to win. Hope you got what you were looking for inside my head. <laughs> that was right. I should have killed you when you were on ice. Kellogg, is that you? What? What are you talking about? You, um, you feeling all right, Nick? Yeah, I'm fine. Why? You sounded like Kellogg just then. Did I? Huh. Mari said there might be some mnemonic impressions left over. Wait, are you just playing a joke on me? I guess that's for you to wonder and for me and Kellogg's memories to know for sure. Those are not the final thoughts of an admirable man. Those are the final thoughts of a monster. We're given the option when talking with father to have pity upon Kellogg. Kellogg was, let's just say he was more complex than you might think. After what he's done, I'm surprised to hear you say that. But if we do, father does not respond with pity. Father expresses his shock and responds not with pity, but with hatred. Hatred bent on revenge. After what I've seen, I pity the man. He was as much of a victim as anything. After what he did to you, I'm shocked you would be so generous. But yes, I understand you've experienced things. Perhaps you ended up knowing him better. I, for one, 
will never truly forgive him. What then is the appropriate response? Is Father right to hate Kellogg for what Kellogg did? Is the sole survivor right to kill Kellogg for what Kellogg did? Or is the sole survivor right to pity him and forgive him? Well, I think I've made it clear how I feel about Kellogg and his life decisions. I don't think he's a wise man. I don't think he's a strong man. I don't think he's courageous. I do think he's a victim, but I don't think that victimhood should be used as an excuse to victimize others. But I will freely admit that he is the man he is today, partially because of his poor life choices and partially because of the failures of his parents. Had he had better parents, had he been raised in a more wholesome environment with a father who could teach him the hard life lessons so that he didn't have to live through those things himself, he might have become a different man. A man who could be strong and an excellent fighter, a wonderful warrior, even a mercenary, but who was principled and who made friends instead of enemies, who redeemed people instead of victimizing them. He could have been sent off into adulthood on the right path if only his parents had done a better job. I still hold Kellogg responsible for the evils that he did in his life, and I'm not going to blame his parents for all of the decisions that he made, nor do I think Kellogg should be able to excuse the things that he does by blaming it on his parents. But I do think it's fair to hold his parents at least partially accountable for the man that they ended up raising, because they had plenty of opportunity to point him in the right direction, and neither of them did. Hey, but that's just the world. They're living in a hard world. They can't help the world that they find themselves in. I don't think that's an excuse. Yes, it's the reality, but even people who have been victimized worse than anyone in this game, people who have lived through the most horrific horrors mankind has ever devised, can still walk away from those experiences with enough dignity, self-respect, and moral fiber to live admirable lives and to raise their children to do so as well. But those are just the thoughts that went through my head while going through this fascinating story. I love the story of Kellogg. He's a rich and dynamic villain. He's not one-dimensional like so many villains in video games. He is a layered individual, and the ability to go back into the man's past and see him as a child and to see him change over time is wonderful. I just relish the ability to do that in Fallout 4. What conclusions did you come up with? Do you agree with me, or do you think I'm totally off base? Am I judging him too hard? Do you think I'm just not being fair to the guy? Or do you think I should take a harder line? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I would love to read your thoughts on this topic. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week, so if you'd like to see what I come up with tomorrow, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. If you'd like an Oxhorn or a Fallout-inspired shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do, and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.